Greetings. My name is Kaviri Robinson. And I am Arzu Osanlu. Thank you for joining us. We are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the Global North. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead experiences in regions across the global south. And yet today, we also attend to autonomous zones within the global north and the forgotten utopian universalism of socialism. Throughout this year, we have been comparing the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment, capitalism and neoliberalism, constitute suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. So today's event is the second of three webinars in our final theme, Rethinking the Human. Here, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of humanitarianism. We do this by exploring how our examination of humanitarianism's multiple genealogies requires us to encompass different modalities of life and to embrace its varied rela relationalities with diverse forms of care. So through this inquiry, we seek mm -hmm. to consider not only the suffering of and care for distant others, but also for the environment, non-human species, and even the dead, who are often assumed to be beyond the limits of care. Today, we are delighted to welcome law professor Dean Spade and our very own postdoctoral fellow, historian Christian Capotescu, to present their talks on mutual aid under conditions of crisis and charity in a socialist context. In each talk, these scholars explore our theme, Rethinking the Human, by attending to what care means through practices that privilege equality, solidarity, shared suffering, and collective self-determination. Our colleague, Borju Ege, one of our pre-dissertation fellows for this Sawyer seminar, will be today's moderator. And now we will turn to her to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Arzu. I would like to welcome our speakers today, Professor Dean Spade and Dr. Christian Kopetescu, who will speak on mutual aid and charity in a social, socialist context. Dean Spade is an activist and associate professor at Seattle University School of Law. He is the author of Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next, published by Verso in 2020. Christian Capotescu is the postdoctoral scholar for the Mellon Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms at the University of Washington. He completed his PhD in history at the University of Michigan in 2020 and is currently work on, working on his first book, Disasters and Solidarities, the Transnational Remaking of Crisis Socialism. We are also joined today by our esteemed colleague, Lynn Thomas, taking the role of discussion for this seminar. Lynn is a historian of politics and gender in 20th century Africa and professor of history at the University of Washington. Today's conversation will start with Dean and Christian's presentations, after which Lynn will, will open the conversation with a few questions. We will then launch into a virtual q and And now, I would like to welcome Dean, Christian, and Lynn, and let them say a few words before we start the pre-recorded talks. Thank you. So glad to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers for pulling us all together for this event. I think this is a really exciting conversation and really grateful for the care and work that went into making it happen. So excited to have this conversation. Hi, everyone. Also from my side, um, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. 
Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and yeah, thanks so much to the organizers for putting this together and I look forward to our conversation. Thanks so much to the um, organizers for inviting me to be part of this series and this session. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I just wanna acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you from Tongva land. I usually live on Duwamish land. Um, yeah, and I'm excited about this conversation about humanitarianisms and about rethinking the human. I'm approaching this um, thinking about the practices that people are doing to survive and resist systems and logics of extraction right now and to reimagine and build a world where human activity is not organized to create wealth concentration, um, a world where no one is disposable, a world where people practice collective self-determination regarding land, water, energy, care, um, which is gonna require developing new social relations. So I'm gonna share some slides that I hope will be useful. I wanted to talk about um, some mutual aid work today. And specifically, I thought it would be nice to start by showing some um, images of some mutual aid work that's been happening in Los Angeles. And I'm thinking about the group Street Watch LA. Um, this is an example of Street Watch LA doing a charging station um, for unhoused people to charge their devices. Um, Street Watch LA uh, organizes mutual aid um, in co cooperation with unhoused people in various parts of Los Angeles. Um, this is an example of um, some of the bolder work of Street Watch LA and other groups um, in Los Angeles. This was back in January, 2020, when um, Los Angeles planned to uh, bring sanitation trucks into Echo Park where a lot of unhoused people had been living and um, you know, evict them and sweep the camp. And people um, blocked those sanitation trucks with their bodies. And I, I think this work is immensely moving and it was successful. Um, the city eventually stopped trying to raid the camp and um, people continued living there for a year until um, just um, at the end of March, the city um, uh, spent a million dollars to um, engage in a really significant police raid of the park and um, evict all of the unhoused people and erect a fence around the entire 16 acre park. Um, I want to just start with this example because I think we're going to be seeing a lot more things like this in the coming years as the housing crisis and the climate crisis um, and economic crisis continue to um, worsen and people are going um, are both doing the kinds of mutual aid that Street Watch LA and other groups do giving out food and water and tents and clothes and also um, going head to head with the cops to defend each other. Um, similar going head to head with ICE to prevent people from being arrested. Um, so I wanted to just sort of begin with thinking about that and this question. Um, a couple of background assumptions, since this is a very short video that just I bring into my work in case they're useful to understand where I'm coming from. One is that I believe social change comes from organi organizing by millions of people, not from charismatic leaders, corporate media coverage, elected officials, courts, or legislatures. So to me, the goal of our social movements is to organize millions of people, um, to bring a lot of people into deep um, engagement in social work and social movement work. Um, I believe that local networked autonomous projects grounded in local knowledges are better at responding to crises and building methods of collective self-determination than um, you know, standardized things at a level of uh, particularly at the national level. And um, I believe that starting with the survival of the most stigmatized people is the most pragmatic approach. And the reason that it, it matters to say that is that uh, most of us are told um, that uh, I think there's a kind of like huge mythology about social change that you should start with people who others can relate to easily and who um, whose lives are already considered valuable. And that um, I think produces actually really harmful interventions um, that tend to leave out and reify the stigmatization of those who've um, already been most considered disposable. So what do I mean by mutual aid? Um, and why do I think it is the, the way that we both mobilize giant movements and help people survive the current crises? 
Um, one thing is that mutual aid obviously is about like what it is, is material support to survive the existing system. It's all the work people do to support people in prisons, to support people facing deportation, to support people who don't have a place to stay, to, um, you know, just get by with what's actually going on. Um, and that work is mutual aid work when it is grounded in understanding that those crises are produced by the systems we live under um, and rather than blaming the people who are in crisis for those crises. Mutual aid also provides like a pathway and a method of political participation that's based in care and action. And that matters because we are all encouraged to be in a pretty passive role um, in our society. Like if you are upset what's about what's happening, you should try to vote for somebody or maybe you send some money to a nonprofit or maybe you post something online. We're really discouraged from, have, from becoming very mobilized or actually taking part in social movements. And so um, mutual aid is most people's on-ramp to social movements, either because they were in crisis and needed something and nobody was giving it out except for these people at the mutual aid project. And then when they got there, to get it, people were like, hey, do you want to be part of collective action to address this crisis for everybody who's facing it? Um, or because they wanted to help people in a crisis that they knew about and they found the mutual aid project um, as the place to do that. It's a place to actually do the work instead of sort of um, observing the work as a passive observer or hoping that elites will take care of it. And um, when we practice mutual aid, we're actually doing the work of building safety and well being. Um, we're actually like, addressing the real issues, trying to build the new world we want to live in. What would it look like for people to have access to housing, to have access to water, to, um, to care about each other and believe in repair instead of believing in putting people in cages, you know? Um, mutual aid both helps us survive disasters and crises and it helps us prepare for the next disasters and crises because when we know what each other's needs are and we have relationships with each other and we know what different resources exist in our communities, we're better able to, you know, find that person on our block who we know is actually stranded on a top floor and now that the lights are out and they um, can't use the elevator um, to come down, right? Or who has a, you know, medical device that needs a battery now that the lights are out and we know who on the block has a solar battery. Like the more we do the mutual aid work starting out, the safer people are um, when the next disaster hits, the next blackout, the next storm, the next hurricane, the next fire, the next flood. And a really important thing about mutual aid is that it's not charity. Um, charity generally celebrates rich people's generosity. Um, it's you know designed to be about, um, it's good PR for rich people. It's about generally saving poor people and blaming them and controlling them. You can get these um, things if you follow the rules here and if you qualify in this way, it's often about identifying who are the deserving poor. So this is only available to you if you, um, you know, are not undocumented, don't have a felony um, record, uh, you know, whatever it is, have children, don't have children, you know, whatever the case may be, are sober, um, take these psych meds, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the charity model is kind of the backdrop of our current nonprofit industrial complex problems, the problems of having nonprofits that provide depoliticized services that can serve very few of the people in need that decide which of those people get services and that kind of stabilize the status quo instead of actually moving us into um, a world in which you know, nobody is without a home or nobody is without um, basic necessities. And, and also another part of this is that nonprofits are you know, like run by elites, funded by elites, and so their work is very constrained by elite interests. There's some basic principles that guide mutual aid work. Um, probably the biggest one, obviously, is that the system, not the people suffering under it, are what creates poverty, crisis, and vulnerability. So whereas charity models tend to be like, well, why are you homeless? You know, it must be because you need to get sober or take a budgeting class or you need this or that. Mutual aid suggests that everyone deserves everything. Um, and that uh, if some people don't have what they need, it's actually a problem with the system, not with like those people's choices or whatever. Mutual aid work um, centers a commitment to the dignity and self-determination of people in need or crisis. Um, so the idea that um, people in crisis actually know the most about what they need to be to, to, to survive and also how the systems that target them work, like people who are, you know, elites often think they know the most about those systems or maybe lawyers and social workers really know the most about those systems, but actually the people who are subject to the violence of those systems know the most about those systems. People who engage in mutual aid projects are making a long-term commitment. It's not like I'm gonna go to a march once a year or I'm going to go work at the, um, you know, soup kitchen on Thanksgiving. It's like, we're gonna 
try to figure out what happens when people get released from jail in our county jail. And we're going to figure out how to be there some days a week and offer people rides when they get out and give them a phone to make phone calls and, you know, make sure they have warm clothes and how are they going to get their meds? And we're just going to like keep doing that and keep trying to figure out how to do that better and keep learning while we do it. It's not a one-time thing. It's like a deep dive into um, addressing the crisis. Most mutual aid projects also are really like significant pathways for new people to join social movements. And so it's important for them to have open meetings, to be like welcoming places like, oh, you just got interested in this. Look, you can get in involved. This is really clear in COVID mutual aid that's emerged um, over the last year. Like so many people who never did any political work before are now in mutual aid projects that are supporting people through COVID in various ways. Um, obviously not every single mutual aid project should have an open pathway. Um, to join because some people are doing illegal and secure work like if what you're doing is trying to help people get abortion drugs that aren't legal in your state you're going to want to have a secure meeting you know um or if you're doing work that the, that is being targeted by the federal government because of the ways you're supporting immigrants you might not um, have open meetings you might have a different kind of security needed but most mutual aid is actually like a really great open on-ramp into social movements for people mutual aid projects are a form of political education and they value political education. So people inevitably, when you show up to a mutual aid project to help with something, you're gonna learn more about the problem than you knew. Like maybe you're really concerned about kids in immigrant detention centers, but then you're also gonna find out things you didn't ever know about the adults and you realize you care about them. And then you never thought through really, what is it like for immigrants with disabilities to go through this process and how are black immigrants specifically targeted? And you know, you're gonna learn more about um, the issue than you knew. So that itself is a form of political um, education. And also many mutual aid groups explicitly do political education with members. Like let's all talk about disability justice. Let's have a workshop about, um, you know, this particular pathway um, that's happening for people or this history um, of people doing similar work to us that you know we've learned a lot from. Mutual aid um, requires humility and willingness to accept feedback. This is not a skill set that's heavily um, valued or developed in um, like capitalist white supremacist sexist culture. So it's something that a lot of groups work on explicitly and do workshops with members about because people are working together like as volunteers horizontally. So you can't like the, the skills we get from being in jobs where you're either bossing people around or being bossed around um, are not gonna work in this environment. For the same reason, people um, need a lot of conflict resolution skills building um, to do this work because anytime we work with people on something we really care about, there's gonna be conflict. Um, that is not a bad thing. Um, and so um, there's a lot of work to build conflict resolution skills and processes inside mutual aid organizations. Um, mutual aid projects value transparency and democracy. Like this is exactly what we did with all the money we raised um, and making sure that everyone gets to make decisions together. This is really different from social services and nonprofits and other um, intervention, charity like interventions. So that's why I wanted to name it. Um, you know, those, those tend to operate more like businesses, like nobody knows how much different people make in the group or um, it's really uneven. Um, and, you know, the community really has no say in the organization. It's like the executive director or the board who are gonna decide what happens. And those people are pretty far from the experiences of people in crisis. And a lot of mutual aid groups, I would say most, really value consensus decision-making processes rather than majority rule. And part of this is that these groups are building a skill that I think a lot of us don't have living in these conditions, which is the skill of desiring other people's participation. Like, I'm bringing a proposal, I think we should do, you know, grocery pickup on Tuesdays, and I want to actually hear what everyone else thinks if people disagree with me so that we can make a better proposal so that we all do it. I don't want to just like ram my idea through the group and not listen to anybody else because then other people just like might stop showing up because they don't think they can't come on Tuesdays or they don't think Tuesday is good because it conflicts with this other really important community thing. Like this idea of being like, I want to share my idea and then I want the idea to get better with the group's wisdom um, is not something most of us have been in a lot of spaces to practice um, in this culture. A few more um, images of mutual aid um, that I think are significant. This is um, this past summer in Seattle, there was obviously a, a cop free zone around the, um, the precinct in Capitol Hill and a lot of mutual aid emerged there. Most of those kind of public occupations, the actual visible architecture of them is mutual aid, right? Is all these tents giving stuff away. Um, this was an example of people giving away food and I love that it's called the no cop co-op. Um, this is an aerial view of that park near the precinct, Kelly Anderson Park, where this zone, this autonomous zone was happening. 
Um, in, the, in the top part of the picture, you see like people's individual tents, all the people staying there and the community gardens that were built that would usually not be allowed in the park during that time, very beautiful. And then in the ball field, you see on the edges, all these other mutual aid tents, like people were giving away haircuts and you get your nails done and tons of hot food and cold food and clothes and mental health support. Um, and this is really like when a lot of a lot of people were showing up to that space to join the movement. They've never done anything about this stuff before and they've driven from, I met a lot of people driven from Idaho and Montana and are like, I wanna join the movement. The first people they come in contact with are usually at a mutual aid tent. Like that's where someone will, could be like, hey, you know? So I really think um, we can't underestimate the significance. And I think these kinds of public occupations are going to be increasing as the crises that we're in increase. Both people who are displaced because of um, all the ways people become unhoused in capitalism and also people being displaced by um, the climate crisis and then other kinds of you know occupations like this one that come out of anti-police protests or other um, protests. Um, so there, there remained an encampment of unhoused people in Cal Anderson Park um, after that. And then in December, 2020, the city of Seattle announced that they were going to raid with police. And so another part of the mutual aid project was that tons of people uh, surrounded the the part of the park that was um, that had unhoused people camping with barricades um, in order to prevent the police from being able to sweep it, um, which is a really you know again that kind of bold work I talked about at the beginning of going head to head with law enforcement um, to protect one another, and of course the city spent untold. I'm sure over a million dollars to um, fill the park with police to destroy people's belongings. Um, and then they can the police continue to occupy the park for days after to ensure nobody else came back. Um, similar work happening in Philly. Um, these were some, there was some outdoor occupations of parks and there was also um, occupations of city owned um, units that have remained empty. Um, and the goal was to force the city to, one of the goals was to force the city to um, allow people to move into the empty housing that it possesses. In Southern California, black moms taking over um, guarded the housing, um, uh, you know, from the police. Um, and eventually the police, of course, did a very militarized, very intense raid of those, um, of that space in, um, in Oakland. So I just wanna, again, like, I always want us to be thinking about mutual aid, both, of, um, you know, with the kind of getting out water and clothes and also the parts that are about, um, um, you know, the boldness that is required to uh, face the inevitable criminalization that happens of any work we do to try to survive um, these extractive systems and how threatening, how deeply threatening it is to these systems um, of extraction when people choose care and sharing and um, collective decision-making and, and really practice new social relations in public. Um, which is, I think, really the stakes of this. Hi, everyone. Before I begin, I want to express my gratitude to Arzun Kabiri for inviting me to give this talk. It has been an honor to be part of the Soya Seminar team this year and to co-organize the Humanitarianisms series. In my talk today, I focus on the ethics and practice of charitable giving under socialism. And I want to make a case for the utility of revisiting an almost forgotten political tradition of utopian universalism that made a powerful promise to the world, namely to champion human well-being through science, industrialization, social progress, and economic equality. Here I am referring to the Eastern European variant of socialism, and it's hopeful, if deeply flawed and ultimately defeated vision of freeing the world from the ravages of capitalist modernity and more even of reshaping the human itself in the process. Let me be clear, this is not to idealize a political system that enabled unspeakable acts of mass violence, oppression, and surveillance. But what I want to suggest to you today is that we can study ethics and visions of humanity even under regimes where political rights and human dignity were perpetually threatened, undermined, and erased. Perhaps in authoritarian contexts, more than elsewhere, the question of how ethics are practiced and reasserted becomes particularly visible and poignant for scholarly inquiry. For this reason, I turn to the daily lives of ordinary people to trace how this ever elusive socialist utopia was lived, practiced, and occasionally rejected, not in theory, but in actuality. Hence my lyrical use of echoes of the new Soviet man as an analytic that enables an inquiry into an ethics of daily living under socialism and its reorientation towards the care for others. 
In this talk, I focus on the late 1980s to show how socialist Romania, under its authoritarian leader, Nicolae Ceausescu, repeatedly moved to the center of the imaginaries and ethical aspirations of citizens in the socialist bloc. In 1981, Romania launched a punitive austerity program to repay its foreign debt, in the course of which the country's general food supply, social services, and natural resources for personal consumption were drastically reduced. Responding to this plunge into austerity, Ceausescu's Romania became a meeting place for private donors and volunteers, feminist and civic groups, countercultural milieus, but also churches, obscure sectarian groups, and ethno-folklorist communities from across the socialist bloc. This was truly a theater of colorful actors engaged in charitable work, motivated by different allegiances, ethnic, national, religious, political, and personal, whom I will refer to as the socialist bloc's private humanitarians. Many such private humanitarians also mobilized against the Romanian state's criminalization of abortion. Others rallied against the regime's discriminatory policies towards the country's ethnic minorities. Some private humanitarians organized support for persecuted religious groups, and others helped family, friends, and the friends of friends. Private humanitarians, to borrow from Michael Barnett, were neither professionals nor card-carrying humanitarians. Instead, they were organized in loose groups, often mobilizing informal campaigns through widely dispersed private networks. In the mid-1980s, millions of clothes, consumer goods, contraceptives, drugs, and other essential everyday items reached Romania through care packages and underground channels. In my work, I propose that the study of private humanitarianism offers a counter-narrative to the often assumed absence of volunteer work in a socialist period by challenging the notion that socialist citizens were deprogrammed from engaging in social issues. Under Marxism-Leninism, the governance of socialist citizens' welfare, so the common assumption, was relegated to politicians, state planners, experts, and centralized state bureaucracies. I want to offer a different reading by arguing that citizens themselves actively participated in shaping and achieving this socialist utopia, helping the less fortunate, the sick, and the poor through acts of charitable giving. Take, for instance, the story of a group of private humanitarians from the East German city of Zwickau. Its group members, Susanne, Achim, Hans, and Rainer, were students in Zwickau who frequently traveled to Romania between 1987 and 1989, supplying needy families, the old, single mothers, and everyone who requested their assistance with much-needed and, at the time, often unavailable goods, such as personal hygiene products, medicine, baby milk, vitamin C, condoms, and many more. The group used inexpensive train routes from Zwickau via Budapest to reach their destination in the city of Brasov in central Romania, transporting sizable amounts of aid across borders, often hidden from customs controls in bags and backpacks. In Brasov, the group coordinated distribution through a local middleman. Remarkably, Susanne Achim Hans and Rainer exhibited an acute sense that their position as donors opened the possibility to be perceived as rich uncles and patrons by their Romanian interlocutors. As such, it became a cardinal ethical rule among group members to unsettle such power asymmetries through a deliberate anti-paternalist posture. This moral cult embraced by the group was itself a product of encounters with the West. Many East Germans maintained active ties to family members, relatives, and friends living on the other side of the Iron Curtain in West Germany. Often, family relations between the two sides entailed material exchanges that ensnared East Germans as the recipients of Western gifts into patronizing and outright degrading relationships with their more affluent Western family members. In their refusal to replicate this experience, Susanne, Achim, Hans, and Rainer's way of relating with their Romanian interlocutors defied such dichotomies as inferior and superior, poor and rich, powerful and powerless, that scholars regularly, and rightly so, invoke when critiquing humanitarian practices and charitable work in capitalist societies, precisely for their tendency to sustain and further entrench rather than surmount inequality. Another facet in the Zwickau group's ethical compass asserted that all people socialized in the political system of state socialism were essentially in need and dependent on each other's trust and solidarity. One group member recalled, quote, 
We didn't have much ourselves in East Germany. Therefore, I found it inappropriate to act as a grand patron in Romania." End quote. What underwrote the socialist ethics of care was a notion of shared poverty and radical equality between those who gave and those who received, echoed in the following remark. Quote, we all grew up in the social order of communism and therefore were able to relate to other suffering. We felt a type of silent solidarity with Romanians, regardless of whether Czechs, Hungarians, Poles, or Romanians, we all belonged to one community. The solidarity has worked beautifully to this very day. End quote. By this logic, if all socialist citizens were essentially needy and dependent upon each other's solidarity, then it was an unlikely proposition to inhabit identities of haves and have-nots as under capitalism. Socialism instead cultivated a positionality of mutual dependency based on an empathy with the suffering of socialist brothers and sisters in Romania that alluded to East Germans' own neediness. And here I want to offer an ideal type model to illustrate how these socialist positionalities compared to their capitalist analogs. Humanitarianism under capitalism is often characterized by a clear economic distinction between donors and recipients that bifurcates into two different social positions. At the top are located the haves, the donors, regularly representatives of the middle class or upper middle and upper classes of society. At the bottom are the recipients, the have-nots and the poor. The accumulation of wealth under capitalism and the attendant forms of economic inequality mediate these unequal relationships. Often, the considerable economic distance between donors and recipients creates and maintains a dualism, which is often further intensified by ethnic, gender, and race divides. In short, humanitarianism under capitalism is dyadic or dualistic. Under socialism, in turn, the economic distance between donors and recipients was dramatically shorter. Often donors and recipients inhabited, in fact, the same class position and social identity. What distinguished the two groups in economic terms was, generally speaking, differential access to consumer goods and welfare provisions in their respective geographic locations. The socialist politics of extolling the virtues of extreme modesty in material life as a rejection of the capitalist accumulation of wealth and unbridled consumerism further blurred the boundaries between donors and recipients. Unlike its dualistic capitalist counterpart, socialist humanitarianism created monistic or unitary social relations that did not pit different social groups against one another. Croatian novelist Slavenka Draculic wrote about these ethical sensibilities that I have described here, and I want to quote her to illustrate my point. Draculic, a socialist citizen of former Yugoslavia, relocated to the United States in the 1990s. There, she witnessed the disturbing coexistence of abject poverty vis-a-vis -vis obscene affluence, prompting her to assert that, quote, there has to be a reason why socialist citizens notice certain things and certain people. There is a deeper reason why the poverty sticks to us, why we recognize beggars, homeless people, bums, petty thieves, drunks, the sick, junkies, why we take it all so personally why it hurts us. It's because we have a communist eye. This eye scans only a certain type of phenomenon. It is selective for injustice." End quote. Draculich's communist eye then refers to an ethics of daily living that crystallized in the charitable work of private humanitarians prompted socialist citizens to seek redress for human suffering as moral agents within a different socio-ethical field of relations than under capitalism. Now let me posit two caveats. First, I want to address the peril of romanticizing peripheral humanitarian practices by highlighting that even under non-capitalist conditions of shared poverty, mutual dependency, and aspirations of radical equality, private humanitarians had to contend more or less successfully with power differentials, human bias, class, ethnic and gender divides, and regional disparities in the socialist bloc. These pervasive tensions make it possible to have productive conversations about the way that cultural, economic, and political arrangements shape and in turn are shaped by humanitarianism. Second, let's talk about politics. I also want to dispel the impression that the daily ethics of care 
I discussed were either an uncritically appropriated expression of Marxist-Leninist doctrine or the opposite, a tactic of resisting state socialism in the shadow spaces of society. I argued that it was neither, and I'm not suggesting that private humanitarians couldn't be politically engaged. Some, in fact, were. But the key is that their work only uneasily fits such binaries, neither depending primarily upon nor requiring a specific political program or ideological position for or against the political regime. In other words, charitable giving offered immediate and practical solutions to human need as a present-oriented moral project that never fully embraced state socialism nor political dissidents envisioning a better future in a reformed political system. By way of conclusion, let me return to a central point and ask, what does the view from the second world reveal about humanitarianism and the idea of humanity? For one, I am not suggesting that state socialism succeeded in creating an ethical paragon in the guise of the new Soviet man, and that the humanitarian practices we glean in the daily encounters between socialist citizens were unrecognizably different from their analogs in the global south or north. Instead, my point is that in the more egalitarian social order of state socialism, the possibilities to achieve a different kind of humanity were always present and reachable, even if never truly accomplished. I also propose that the view from the second world can unsettle the assumption that the secular, rationalist, scientific regimes of state socialism in the second half of the 20th century, seeking rapid industrial modernization coupled with authoritarian control, stifled the flourishing of ethical life. Indeed, politically coercive regimes may offer unlikely glimpses into possible alternatives to practice humanity. All of this is to suggest that a more capacious understanding of humanitarianism, as developed through this year-long Soya seminar, will hopefully invite further reflections about how different historical contexts inflect the universal human disposition to forge bonds of collaboration across time and space. And for students and practitioners of humanitarianism, my hope is that this contribution opens new possibilities of imagining alternative futures in which the care for others is rescued from the entrapments of global capitalist modernity. Thank you. Hello, everyone. These were wonderful presentations. And now we return to Lynn for her conversation with Dean and Christian. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for those two wonderful presentations. Um, they're both so rich and I so appreciate the ways that both of you are thinking so kind of deeply and thoughtfully about the politics and the ethics of care. And it's just great to have these two different, a present day and historical perspective um, in dialogue with each other. It's really wonderful. Um, so my first um, kind of question relates to the genealogies of private humanitarianism and mutual aid. So it's really a question about like, what are the prior histories behind what you're talking about and how might there be kind of tensions or overlaps in the different genealogies? Um, so for Christian, I was really interested in what you were saying about the ethos of mutual dependency and the enduring inspiration of the Soviet man. Um, and also the fact that the class differences between the different historical actors you're talking about um, really related more to who could access certain resources or certain welfare benefits given their um, specific geographic location rather than to really mark differences in wealth. So I think um, that's just really interesting. So my question is um, what prior kinds of social action did private humanitarianism in East Germany, Hungary, in, your, in Romania build upon and possibly feed into? So were there religious or ethnic or feminist or queer or some kind of post-communist socialist or um, anarchist traditions? Um, and I'm just wondering if historical actors, um, how they enacted kind of or worked on those histories and if they saw kind of tensions or contradictions between them and this more um, open-ended notion of mutual dependency. Um, and for Dean, I was also really in curious about the historical precedents um, for the model of mutual aid that you're putting forward. Um, so in some of your writings and other talks, I've heard you um, reference the Black Panthers breakfast programs. I've also heard you mention um, gay and trans organizing in response 
um, to the ongoing HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and right now I'm teaching a course on the global history of AIDS. And so those forms of organizing are very much in my mind. Um, so um, I guess specifically, I was wondering if you see queer forms of non-blood family making that were part of and came out of a lot of HIV AIDS um, Karen activism as offering particular insights and strategy for mutual aid today. And then I guess more broadly, I was just wondering if you see your vision of mutual aid as having distinctly like US or American roots or how, in, or if in the 21st century you see kind of it as a more global um, formation. Should I go first? <laughs> go ahead. All right. Um, well, thanks for this question. It's, it's a really important one and a great one. And you correctly point out, I mean, charity certainly has a very long historical pedigree. Um, and we could have conversations about the rise of sort of the idea of charity in the 18th century. Um, but I really want to, to, to stay more confined to the socialist period and point out that really until 1945, uh, until the 1970s and between 1945, sort of, sort of the beginning of the socialist period in, in Eastern Europe, and the 1970s, there is not much of a precedent for such more widely organized networks of charitable giving. Um, what we will find, however, in the socialist period is sort of the, the general story of um, dissidents and academics, intellectuals, and sort of political adversaries of these regimes that were active. But I don't think that that history that is very well known and very well studied really explains why in the 1970s and then later in the 1980s, uh, even more so, there is this outburst of uh, an emergence of private humanitarianism, uh, especially in East Germany and in uh, Hungary. Um, and there are two parallel developments that I would like to point out briefly. Um, so what happens in the mid to late 1980s is that this is a time of uh, rising civic and political reform movements in East Germany, so the Bürgerrechtsbewegung um, in that country, um, really creates a new window of opportunity for ordinary people, uh, students, um, and people from all walks of life to reimagine re what social change could look like in a socialist bloc. So there are um, all kinds of peace, environmental, feminist groups as part of this civic rights movement, there are uh, church initiatives um, that are being sort of slowly developed in sort of in clandestinity and these sort of shadow spaces um, of East German society um, and all kinds of culture counter counter cultural and sometimes rather nebulous sectarian groups that start to become engaged in community building across the block and Romania becomes one of these places where intense attention is uh, being drawn to. Um, so there is this sort of emergence of new publics uh, that are galvanized around mobilizing causes like ethnic discrimination in uh, Romania, the anti-abortion legislation in the country, the systemization of villages and many more um, problems. Um, but what is important about this aspect is that these mov movements were not primarily about toppling the system, uh, replacing socialism, but about reforming it. Um, and it is an extremely heterogeneous group. Uh, and this is why I'm referring to it as a kind of uh, a colorful theater of different actors, because it is very hard to really pinpoint um, a single sort of driving force be be behind these different initiatives. And there's a second development that sort of expands this movement even further in the mid to late 1980s. Um, there is really an extreme economic plunge in Romania due to austerity that really calls, draws attention across the socialist bloc. And it's a very, very unique moment and singular um, economic crisis that itself sort of um, mobilizes people without political commitments to come to the rescue of sort of the Rom Romanian population. Um, and, and and I think this way of looking at this sort of movement, movement of private humanitarians is really helpful in sort of thinking about this as, as, as a much more widespread and capillary kind of practice that becomes entrenched in all kinds of political and non-political groups rather than sort of a um, coherent social movement that then uh, emerges in, in, in this period. 
That was, it was really fun to hear more about your work just now and have you paint that for us, Christian. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so let me address this question, this really good question that Lynn asked. I think the piece around um, the kinds of, you know, queer family making and support systems that um, I think, you know, are really visible in, in people um, supporting each other and surviving um, the height of the AIDS crisis and ongoing. And I think also, of course, before that in queer and trans communities. Um, I guess what I, so I think that like, you know, because capitalism, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, heteropatriarchy are designed to like make certain people's lives impossible, we're always like getting by, <laughs> you know, like we're always like doing stuff to survive together. And um, some, some people call all of that mutual aid, like every moment of care and generosity, which is of course all countercultural and amazing. I'm kind of trying to provoke a conversation about mutual aid in which we look at its ties to like organized resistance. And so there's a lot of people in the period of the height of the AIDS crisis doing direct support to one another as, and like recruiting each other to like a political opposition to the you know, failure of public health strategy around um, HIV and the, um, you know, the genocidal, you know, racist, anti-queer, um, you know, uh, US approach to um, HIV AIDS. So I feel like that's the part probably I'd be most interested in looking at is like, like, and how does that relate? I really love Katie Botts's book that came out it's called Before AIDS. That's like, looks at like the rise of like gay VD clinics um, in a few places in the United States that led to that. And then they became institutionalized and became like sort of some of the big um, queer and trans health clinics that are still around today. And like, like how the role of like people based mutual aid health clinics was part of like all kinds of movements in the 60s and 70s and then how they institutionalize and become nonprofits and tend to lose a lot of their more radical um, potential. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's the, the place I'm really looking at. And it's interesting to try to think about like historically, like mutual aid historic, uh, historical roots because everywhere where, where life is made impossible, people do things to take care of each other while they resist. Like you, you never see resistance, resistance that doesn't also include like survival like it's just it's not you know but part of the reason my project exists or the reason i thought it was worthwhile to start trying to popularize the idea of mutual aid around 2016 and i've been doing mutual aid for a long time was because the way social change is narrated particularly in the united states but i think elsewhere as well um, at times is that uh, social change happens when people change laws or when elites or congresses or courts do things and that um, social movements are even narrated as just the actions of particular elites who claim that they are the leaders of those movements. Um, and there's this kind of lack of, um, I'm so sorry about all the background noise here and in the video I made, it's just beyond my control. Um, uh, so there's, so I'm interested in us um, unearthing like who, what really are movements made of? They're made of tons of ordinary people supporting each other's survival. At that time, most people enter movements and part of the erasure of that um, work is because that work is disproportionately done by women and particularly women of color um, and, and other people who are responsible for social reproduction in, in our different cultural spaces. I think that my, because I, you know, I study movements around the world because I like really care about studying how change happens and what people are trying, but all of my work as, as an organizer is all in the U.S. So my perspective is super narrow in that way. It's super oriented towards um, U.S. histories and, um, and there are flashpoints in U.S. history that U.S. organizers talk about a lot to illustrate mutual aid, like the Black Panther Party's programs, because it's such a clear example of um, of a kind of you know mutual aid work that was totally tied to this like deep radical armed struggle, and it was um, uh, very threatening to the U.S. government to the point that it was you know destroyed by police um, frequently and um, and targeted by the FBI. And I think people look a lot um, also at um, mutual aid societies. Um, created by formerly enslaved people and by free people to like welcome people into cities who, who, who've escaped slavery and to make sure that people have the basic things they need and, and, and similar um, programs for people migrating to the US. I think there's like sort of, you know, key flashpoints of feminist um, health movement that people look at as a way to just see this role of this type of work in movements as, as essential to building movements. But a lot of what's been fun about working on trying to popularize this idea more um, over the last five years is that I enjoy hearing from people about what mutual aid looks like in their context, you know, and like what role it has in the movements they're part of, um, or in movements they study that are um, historical and just like this this tension I really see in Christian's work that I'm really interested in about like to what degree and when were these efforts um, like tied to people's political visions 
And, and when was it people who were actually pretty depoliticized about certain kinds of political action, but they were taking them anyway. And I'm really curious, like when, when did doing mutual aid work or private humanitarian work in that context, did it ever draw people into then doing feminist work or into then doing, you know, like I'm kind of, I'm curious whether there were, um, whether it, it, it in the in the context and space you're studying was was it an entry point sometimes to other political action or were there reasons that it was deterred or were there people who were trying to use it to recruit people into political action which I think is part of what we see now so I think it's an interesting because um, it's a you know a, a realm I know so much less about so it's really fun to hear about um, the context you're studying. Yeah, and that question of whether the work is then, I think, Dean, as I've heard you put in other contexts, kind of an on-ramp to being involved in social movements or not, I think that is a really interesting one that um, Christian could answer as well. But let me try to squeeze in one more question before we open it up to everyone else. And so this is a question that relates um, more to kind of states and public infrastructure. So um, my background or what I study is African history, so African politics. And so I'll, I'll try to say this question quickly. Um, so, you know, if you look at the long durée of African history, there have been so many different political formations, you know, over millennia across different parts of the continent. So, you know, there have been large centralized states, there have been, you know, very small polities or really just very local communities, um, often like governed by councils of older men and women. So, you know, African history is filled with lots of different, you know, kinds of political formations. Um, and, but I would say, you know, beginning in the mid 20th century with the anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles, um, part of those movements, so the anti-colonial movements, um, was about placing demands on the state, placing demands on the colonial state, but then placing demands on the post-colonial state. So things that people wanted the state to deliver. And very often in imagining these things, you know, Af um, activists or politicians in Africa were inspired by things like the Soviet Union or communist China. And so there were all kinds of, you know, forms of politics that emerged in the post-colonial period that were generally glossed as African socialism. And that African socialism meant different things in different places, but it often combined an attention to very local community actions like local communities coming together to build a school that maybe then the state would send a teacher to staff or, but then there could also be very big state projects like um, Ujamaa villages in Tanzania or something like that. Okay, so that's kind of the 60s and 70s. And then in the 1980s, um, structural adjustment and austerity policies come to um, much of Africa as to Romania and other places. Um, and so a lot of what was imagined or built under African, so, uh, under African socialism um, then kind of gets dismantled or waylaid. But the demand that the state provides certain kinds of things like universal schooling and healthcare, clean water, and I would say today in, in terms of public health, um, access to COVID-19 vaccine is a big issue obviously for um, all kinds of people. So my question then is, in in your two accounts, what role is there for states and I, and the provision of public infrastructure? And so Christian, I was wondering if your private humanitarian is, if they had an alternative vision of the state, did they have a vision of a state that was socialist, but just more democratic? Did they envision something like West Germany as the model or did they have something else entirely in mind? And, and maybe, you know, partly this relates to maybe what Dean was asking about the relationship between political visions and kind of the um, mutual support work that they were doing. Um, and I guess Dean, you know, to put it provocatively, I guess I just wonder if mutual aid lets the state off the hook too easily. So, I mean, if we think back to, I think one of the most powerful critiques that feminists made of neoliberal policies, it was that neoliberal policies basically took so much of this work of social welfare and social reproduction, took it off the plate of the state and then like handed it to then, you know, basically non-governmental organizations or nonprofits that had to take it up. And so I guess I'm just wondering in your vision of mutual aid, you know, particularly if we think about the um, current COVID pandemic, like, is there a role and what is the role for state public health infrastructure? So things like, um, you know, developing and distributing vaccines or, you know, more broadly, something like Medicare for all. So those are big questions, but I will just leave them out there for you. Christian, did you want to start again? Sure, I, I can do that. Um, and, and this is a terrific question. And I think it goes to the heart of many of our conversations um, on humanitarianism, on charity, on mutual aid. 
But I do want to also respond indirectly to this question. And I want to respond by pushing back against it. Because I think that private humanitarians were not an anti-state nor a pro-state movement. And there were never clear commitments or sort of uh, art articulated programs and ideas that tackled that question head on. Um, and I think the contemporary political discourse in the US that you so greatly pointed out and, and sort of unpacked for us, um, oftentimes seems to me um, as a sort of European scholar um, that it, it sort of departs from a binary that positions the individual and society in a kind of zero sum game against the state, right? Um, and it, the, th this binary, of course, then always leads to questions about the role of the state and the ability of state institutions to provide in moments of crisis. Um, and I think Dean rightly insists that grassroots, grassroots politics might be a space where social change can occur. Um, but I do think that this is, in, in many ways, a decisively American conversation that plays out this kind of cultural struggle to define the role of the individual versus vis a vis the federal government and its institutions. And I think that these assumptions would have seemed rather alien and unfamiliar to the actors in Eastern Europe that I study back in the 1980s. Uh, and remember, the historical context of 1980s Eastern Europe was a very different one. Private humanitarians were carving out spaces for unsanctioned social action and participation within an authoritarian regime where there didn't exist a public square, where there was no civil society, there didn't exist the possibility to publish and speak freely, to publicly gather and protest against the state. None of this was generally possible, of course, with some exceptions like the Solidarity Movement in Poland. So the question was not, can the socialist state provide in times of crisis? And isn't the street and the grassroots community a better place to push for change and to tend to human welfare? But rather, I think the question was, how can ordinary citizens themselves participate and shape the conditions of living a more dignified life under socialism by practicing care, hospitality, and forms of sharing in moments of crisis? And um, by extension, how may ordinary citizens contribute to reforming the system, not abolishing it by making it more participatory, democratic, and just within, and again, not against sort of the idea of socialism. Um, so the problem is that uh, is, is not that there wasn't a state that needed to be built, but that there had been a state previously that failed to deliver. And now what? What do we do as ordinary citizens once the state fails to deliver um, the, the promises of this sort of socialist utopia that we all signed up for? Um, and my, many private humanitarian often self-consciously conceived of their own work as a kind of stopgap measure uh, that tinkered with the multiple social crisis symptoms in, in Ceausescu's Romania. But again, this logic did not translate into aspirations to replace the state by something else. Um, so the recognition of failing public infrastructures did not prompt many hum private humanitarians to reject the state, but actually to find ways to improve human welfare through these sort of direct, immediate, material forms of solidarity. Thanks. I love that reframe. That's really interesting for me to think about. I've been having some interesting conversations lately with friends about to what degree, to what degree my take on this question is related to my very US location. You know, so I think this is really, really true even today in terms of what people in various parts of the world, particularly in the global south, see as possibilities inside the state forms they're living under. But I will say that from my perspective, when I think about the kinds of crises we're facing living in the US and that the US is causing around the world and has been. Um, I just like, yeah, maybe it lets the US off the state, off the hook to be like, yeah, you're, you do not like, we're gonna do mutual aid, but it's like, we don't have a choice. Like the US government has never provided disaster relief or poor relief in ways that weren't deeply racist, deeply gendered and colonial. And so um, inevitably, like the same people get left behind whenever they do, you know, like if they, whether it's a stimulus check and who can get that and who can't and undocumented people and people in 
criminalized trades, et cetera, or whether it's the way that, you know, all the other forms of state welfare are provided or whether it's how FEMA you know, shows up in a, in a disaster. Um, I just have no faith that, that the U.S. is going to start providing disaster relief and poor relief in some kind of like neutral, fair way. And I don't think anybody who actually studies social welfare in the U.S. could believe that. I mean, it's a, it's a settler colony. It's going to be a colonial project, whatever the, um, the aid is. So given that, people have always had to do mutual aid who are part of who's left out, you know, like whoever who can't access um, whatever the social welfare or disaster relief systems are. That's always how um, we've lived. And um, so there's nothing new about that. I often, you know, um, I, so some people are like mutual aid, it's, it, it shouldn't be being talked about so much during COVID because we, because it's letting the state off the hook. But I think for me, it's like, um, all public health in infrastructure that is produced by this government is going to be like anti-black, like sexist, you know, um, colonial and, um, and, and has been. And so um, some people are like, let's provide this because then inevitably the state grants concessions. Like you do get concessions when we have uprisings. And so, yeah, you get concessions, you get another stimulus check or sometimes, you know, sometimes there's a brief period of welfare being expanded during big uprisings in the United States. Um, and then it's contracted, you know? So I'm like, we should celebrate the concessions. We should be like, yeah, we won that because we rose up. And that's a, that's a signal that we are um, organized and mobilizing. But I also, um, it's an unsatisfying, it's not the end point for me. So like, let's celebrate concessions. But some people are more like hopeful that like, you know, under some future US government, like what government, I can't even imagine like who's, you know, is it, we're gonna like get the good stuff from, um, from the US government, so, or from our state governments or city governments. So I, you know, I'm very much involved in direct work to try to help people like get the stuff that is out there. Like, yes, I spend my life fighting for people's social security benefits and welfare benefits, or currently involved in like de efforts to defund the police and have the police budget go instead to like childcare or housing or healthcare. I think that's a good move to make. Those are concessions we should seek. And I have no faith that like that childcare or healthcare or housing is gonna be provided in ways that don't keep cutting out you know, black trans people and uh, people with particular disabilities, you know, like they are, you know, so I just, um, I think it's just kind of a pragmatic, like, yeah, more disasters are coming and I, and we can't hold on to any fantasies about it, like a, a, a loving social welfare state in the US. And I think I have questions about that elsewhere. And I'm in conversation, of course, with other anarchists and other spaces about how they see it in their own context. Fundamentally, the idea that the nation state form, something that is defined by militaries, borders, and cages should be what determines who has vaccines and how we develop them. Like there's something wrong with that. And we can see it <laughs> playing out, you know, in our lives right now. So I think that for me, I can have like a principled opposition to the nation state form and, and, the, and, and concerns that for me are mostly based in like a woman of color, feminist and anarchist perspective. And I can do day-to-day -to -day work to help people get through those systems and imagine that, um, you know, kind of have a sober reflection that the United States government isn't gonna start being something different than it is and has been. And what it is designed for is extraction that is deeply like racialized and colonial and gendered. So that's kind of how I, I hold that. It's not an absolutist position to not like help people get through their deportation proceedings and hopefully not get deported or help people get their welfare check that they're being illegally denied. But it's also like when you work in those systems doing that support, there's it's so clear that they're genocidal and that they're not designed to like give care or support and they're not gonna become that. Like I think the current presidency is like just such a clear, you know, like it's not gonna become, no matter who is president, vice president, it's not going to become something that it's never been here. So I think that's my sort of take on it. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, I will bow out so Virtue can um, involve some of the other questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a great conversation. And that this belief I also share, I want to tell you, Dean. <laughs> okay, so we have received a lot of questions. So we want to circle back a little bit to like more theoretical underpinnings, because we have been dealing with these questions of like humanitarianism, charity, giving, care. And uh, there is one question that I wanted to pose from here that is about discussions around charity. So Dean very specifically and critically and Christian in a different period, region of the world and economic system, you talk about the concept of charity and from a very alternative point of view, right? Uh, but the question goes, charity has a long history and broad global iterations. Would you suggest that the problematic aspects of charity are timeless or that they emerge through late capitalism's extractive and transactional features? 
And in other words, are the private humanitarians that Christian speaks of more like members of contemporary mutual aid groups or charities? This is a question that you both can extrapolate on, I think. This is a great question and it's a difficult question to answer. So let me let me try to, to make sense of it. And the way I look at charity is that I, I, I look at it as a lens really to, to mm -hmm. study society. And um, historically speaking, I think charity and the appearance of charity points to the fact that it is an integral part of the social history of capitalism. And generally speaking, the study of charity uh, can be used as a kind of a barometer to gauge levels of inequality in any given society, system of distributive justice, the constitution of national welfare states, uh, the uh, ideo ideological supremacy of certain economic ideas over others, government politics, and many other arenas of modern societies that Dean pointed to where human welfare is concerned. Um, and as such, I think the existence of charity is therefore not just um, sort of a byproduct of neoliberalism. It is much more intimately imbricated in the economic fabric of capitalism and its reigning logics. Um, and as problematic as charity often is, I think it itself mirrors and replicates precisely the kinds of economic, social, and political arrangements in which it operates. Um, and that, of course, um, also sort of allows us then to look at charity and, and see that indeed in societies where there is more charity, um, there is also more unequal and socially undemocratic uh, there's a sort of a more unequal and socially undemocratic um, uh, sort of framework in which uh, these campaigns emerge. So there's a, this kind of direct link between more charity and less democratic uh, welfare provisioning and, and all the sort of social ills that we could point out. Um, but by, by this very same logic then, one would have to be very fair and say the existence of private humanitarianism in the socialist period is also an indication for crisis in indeed rapidly falling standards of living. It is a symptom for the breakdown of essential welfare provisioning of oppressive forms of pronatalism that went to the very heart of family planning, of social policies that were intertwined with ethnic discrimination in a society where ostensibly the socialist state provided for all of its citizens. Um, so, in a way, I think that private humanitarians and mutual aid practitioners are, in a, in, a, in a way, different variations of the same genre, a kind of maybe stopgap movement that share a commitment to address forms of inequality, material need, and human suffering. But those very conditions are not a monopoly of uh, capitalism. They might be more exacerbated in the sort of post-Washington consensus climate in the US. But socialism itself was ripe with humanitarian crises that called upon private publics to intervene in, in moments of state failure, in moments of welfare retrenchment and political oppression. Um, so I think I'm just gonna leave it here and let Dean maybe say something. It's such an interesting question, especially to think about against all that I'm learning from Christian's work. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't, I never want to say anything is like timeless or whatever, right? Like, I guess I, where I, where I look to like understand what I'm saying about charity is I really look at like that classic text regulating the poor by Piven and Cloward from the 70s about the origins of social welfare and poor relief in Europe. And so what I get from that text is like, um, when people are displaced and dispossessed because of changes in industrial relations and economies, um, then, um, you know, they become unruly and different forms of charity and aid are, are, are developed to control them. Right. And like, that's that, so that idea feels like those are the roots of that kind of European root is the root of contemporary charity and social services and nonprofits in the United States. Like to me, that's, that's the thing that mutual aid is resisting is, is forms of relief that are system sustaining for the extractive processes. But I think it's interesting to like think about what Christian was just saying, um, because I there are crises can be caused by um, like the state formation itself for people, even if it's not an explicitly capitalist state, there's still dispossession that can happen. There's still um, forced, um, people are being forced into and out of industries. You know, like I so said, that is, that is not alone a, a capitalist condition. I think it might be a condition about being under someone else's control, about not having collective self-determination of the 
um, circumstances of our lives and of what work means to us and what um, basic resources and needs, how they're met. And so, yeah, I think that Christian's work like complicates that in a really useful way. Thank you so much. So we have two questions. It looks like our audience is thinking of the concept of consensus and how to achieve consensus, what to do to achieve consensus. So one question is directly about this towards Dean. And this person asks, how can we cultivate consensus taking into consideration power dynamics that might be present in a place? And the other question starts with a remark saying that given how divided we are as people in the United States, can social ch change happen without the hope of consensus? And in that case, who gets to dictate what is to be done? So in general, how to create and cultivate consensus and within the context of United States, our attendees are wondering. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so yeah, so uh, trying to make decisions together by consensus does not mean the power dynamics go away. <laughs> you know, it's not like a, perf it's not a perfection standard, but if, you know, if, if five of us are trying to decide where to go to dinner, you know, we're already, we already have an option of either just like, we're just going to go wherever Christian says, or we're going to like actually have a conversation because Christian's the oldest or the smartest or whatever we've decided that makes Christian better than the rest of us. Or we can be like, well, Christian's vegetarian and Dean doesn't, can't eat that, you know, we can actually have like, oh, and then Christian's like, oh, near my house is better. And I'm like, uh, like that we, we already practice this and it's imperfect and their and power dynamics emerge. And, um, and so I think part of what mutual aid groups and, and other kinds of political groups that are using consensus too, is like, we try to attend to power dynamics. That's why we're having like, we're gonna have a disability justice political ed session, or we're gonna use go rounds to make sure we hear from everybody so that like, you know, Dean doesn't always talk too much, or we're going to have an explicit conversation about that power dynamics that Dean's the oldest person in the group and, you know, or that so-and-so is popular. Or like we're actually like groups, these groups really spend time talking about power dynamics, which doesn't mean that we like graduate from them, you know, um, but the other alternative is just to like have the normal system be the way it works. Like Dean's the oldest, so he's going to do it, or Dean's the one getting paid, or Dean's the professor, you know, like, um, I mean, there's not, I don't see a better alternative in terms of dealing with the power dynamics beyond an attempt at consensus, which is always imperfect and developing. Um, and in terms of this question, like it's, yeah, it does sound scary to try to reach consensus across like all people in the United States. One, I hope that we're not working at the scale of the United States, like you, like organizing happens at a local scale, right? And it, then it's networked with solidarity. So probably we're working like, you know, some of us are working on trying to support the encampment of unhoused people in Cal Anderson Park, and we're connected to people who are in the Transit Riders Union, and we're connected to the Longshoremen's Union people, and we're connected to people who are trying to do work to stop this new jail from being built in our town. And like, we're all doing consensus work in our own groups that's building and increasing our solidarities and political education and the ability to have each other's backs. And if we imagine this on a bigger scale, like if we imagine that you know, if we imagine living without the nation state and corporations defining our lives so much, it could be that there's like a group of people who are working together on energy for this county and they're trying to transition to this other form of energy and they're working by consensus and they're in communication with this, you know, parents collective and also in the, with the food growers collective. And, you know, these kinds of models, a lot of people look to, um, you know, the Zapatistas or what's gone on in Rojava or, you know, people look to spaces in which people are trying to self-govern many kinds of work and resource distribution and having a health clinic and having a school and figuring out who's, how the water is going to come into the village. Like people, you know, before you can find um, these practices happening all over the world, certainly before something bigger comes in and says, no, we're going to run this for you, like before the colonial intervention, before you can find them con in contemporary indigenous communities often, and you can also find them in different resistance formations. But, you know, I guess there's a fundamental belief that I have that people can make decisions together for the good of all, and that what gets in the way of that is extractive technologies, extractive industries, um, colonialism, white supremacy. And so, um, yeah, it's a leap of faith, but it's not like it would be perfect then, but it would certainly be better than having like the boot of the current governments on our neck while we're trying to both eke out a living and um, and find ways to not be horrible to each other, right? And so I think like um, it requires, I think it's really useful to read science fiction to try to think about this big because it's so far from what we're living and I, I do, do that a lot. Um, but I think it's also useful to just look at like, what are the ways that we already have some of these skills in some of our relationships. And for a lot of us, that happens the best in friendships. It doesn't happen very well in families where there's domination or schools or workplaces. Like most of those places are very hierarchical, but many people have had some experience with consensus decision-making in 
consensual friend networks. And then also it's useful to just look at like who's practicing it. Like if, if you get that feeling like this is impossible, then it's like, well, people are doing it. So it's not impossible um, and it's complicated and imperfect. And um, that's kind of the only option. We don't have like a way to do the work perfectly or to not have power dynamics. Like we're going to have racism and, you know, sexism and all these things in all the work we do regardless, but we can try, you know, which is kind of like the only possible way out of what we're in, which we may not get out of um, given the crises that we're facing. Thank you. So I think uh, we have time for one more question and maybe if I can get a quick answer. So this question is for Christian and uh, it goes as this. You ended your talk by reminding us of the importance of considering different historical periods and social contexts through which we might see new possibilities for both humanitarianism and rethinking the human. I was wondering whether in Romania today, there is any nostalgia for these kinds of relations, especially for private humanitarians. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, so I'm trying now to go from science fiction and better futures to back to the past and uh, understanding uh, how people felt about it. Um, and, and I will say the people I interviewed and worked with did voice a kind of sustained sense of loss and longing for those intimate bonds and economies of friendship and trust that thrived in the sphere of informality in, in socialism, um, which were, as, as many of my interlocutors insisted, lost in the commodified lives that began to take shape under capitalism in the 1990s. And I think nostalgia is a good work to think through some, some of these ideas, uh, but it also, of course, points to an idealized version of a lost past that was never that great to begin with. Um, but I do think there is a kernel of truth about the experience that people ha had under socialism um, as a system that provided forms of safety and security for the many, not just the few, that really got lost. Um, and how even under conditions of deprivation, shortage, need, and even oppression, unexpected forms of solidarity and int intimacy could be forged, um, which today are really largely lost in, in the consumer societies of of capitalism. Thank you so much. Awesome. Now I'm turning over Kabiri for her concluding remarks for this event. So we have come to the end of today's webinar and we would so much like to thank Dean and Christian and Lynn and our technical organizers, especially Caitlin Palo, and for all of you for your continued interest in this series. Uh, we very much look forward to hosting you again. And so on May 6th, we will welcome uh, Professors Juno Salazar Pareñez and Nermin Mufta, who will be discussing humanitarian care for non-human others. And so on behalf of all of the organizers, we wish everyone a great day, a good evening, and thank you for coming.